15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again. Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Space Nuts podcast, heard everywhere except my place because my wife doesn't understand astronomy. Uh, My name's Andrew Dunkley and uh, with me as always, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hey, how are you doing, Andrew? Good to talk to you again. And to you too. Um, Maybe the last time after what I just said about my wife. Now, Uh, Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I I wouldn't have touched that one myself, but... (laughs) Uh, she's used to me now. I think. <laughs> now you're in Adelaide. Uh, I am. That's right. I'm in Adelaide, South Australia, where I'm doing a couple of talks. I did a talk last night uh, and one at, again tonight. So then back up to Sydney tomorrow. Oh, busy time. Uh, yeah. I've never been to Adelaide. I'm going to get there one day. Oh, it's a lovely city. Yeah, city you should of do churches, it. isn't it? Uh, that's what it's called, the city of churches, but it's got a lot more besides that. Uh, and uh, I've always found it a you know very a very pleasant place to visit. Mm, and the people who talk funny, <laughs> they say they talk funny, but they all sound Aussie to me. So yeah. it make a difference. <laughs> oh dear. Now today we're going to be talking about India's plan to land something on the moon and uh, these uh, new fast radio bursts that have been detected, but have uh, certainly thrown up more questions than answers. Speaking of which, we're going to be talking uh, about some questions that have come in about neutrinos, a near-Earth asteroid that's uh, headed our way soon. And can we develop slow descent spacecraft uh, by creating our own fuel in space? Uh, interesting questions, Fred. We'll get to those soon. But uh, let's uh, talk about this plan by um, India um, to to land on the moon possibly this weekend. Well, that's right. Yes. And in fact, you know, this is um, <laughs> for, it's two, the planned landing date is two days from when we're recording this. So there's a good chance that it will have um, happened by the time some people have heard. Exactly that. Podcast. Yes. So um, uh, you must forgive us if uh, if what we're saying now really doesn't make any sense by the time you get to listen to it. However, it's very exciting. I'm um, really looking forward to seeing how this uh, this mission pans out. Uh, so it is the Indian Chandrayaan-2 mission, uh, which was launched, if I remember rightly, back on the 22nd of July, um, with a fairly leisurely transfer to the moon by the spacecraft, which is quite big. The um, the Chandrayaan orbiter is a fairly sizable one because it carries on board um, a lander, mm. uh, which, of course, will land, and the lander itself carries on board a rover, which will rove once uh, once the landing has taken place. So the uh, the current status is that Chandrayaan, the orbiter, is indeed in orbit around the moon. Um, it, uh, it that has all gone really successfully. Uh, I think great great credit to the Indian uh, Space Research Organisation ISRO. Uh, they uh, you know seem to have taken this uh, project uh, at a, with a very high level of success, and all credit to them for that. But the the crucial time, which the space agency is describing as the 15 minutes of terror, is when the lander actually uh, dr- drops down onto the lunar surface, um, hopefully uh, safely. That is the part of uh, a mission like this which is most critical. Uh, we, we kind of, you know, we've got used to seeing successful landings on the moon from uh, space agencies like NASA and Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, uh, but uh, it, it's still a, a process fraught with difficulty because you've, you've got to just judge exactly right the uh, you know, the thrust needed to slow your spacecraft down so that when it touches the moon, it's not traveling at two two meters per second or anything, sorry, two kilometers per second, but traveling uh, at, at a, a matter of a few centimeters per second. Well, um, there, have, there have been some famous miscalculations over the years where things have gone into the, into the moon and into uh, Mars or Venus or whatever at full tilt because yeah. of uh, calculations that were, um, well the wrong way around, basically, but uh, hopefully they they won't run into any issues like this. We're certainly um, going with that 15 minutes of or seven minutes of or eight minutes of terror (laughs) approach on a regular basis now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I live with 24 hours of terror every day, (laughs) but not for for those reasons. So 
you know, assuming that um, by the time people listen to this, all will be well. Uh, the, um, the, the 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 details are that uh, the the lander is called uh, Vikram. It's named in honour of the person who founded uh, the the Indian Space Programme, uh, and that carries a rover whose name is Pragyan, a lovely Sanskrit name which means wisdom, uh, which is something that's always sadly lacking on space nuts. But never mind uh, on the Indian space. <laughs> spacecraft it will be there and so the, the the lander's got essentially you know sensors which will be uh, actually detecting moonquakes that's one of the things um I was going to ask what's the purpose of the mission yeah um, they're also um I, I like this very much um uh, there's a nasa retro reflector on board as well and you remember these are the, the kinds of things that were left behind by apollo astronauts mm. So that when you fire a laser at the moon, you get a direct reflection back and can time do a time of flight measurement of the distance to the moon. Uh, so that there is a, a, a laser reflector uh, carried on board uh, Vikram, the lander. Um, and then the, the rover itself uh, basically has got, you know, um, chemical uh, analysis uh, instruments on board, uh, which will look at the minerals. And this this actually is... Perhaps the you know the really interesting part of this mission is where they're locating the landing site because it's very close to the moon's south pole, um, which of course is a bit at the top from our vantage point yes. here in Australia, um, and uh, it, it it sort of in in some ways mimics where the Chang'e spacecraft is, uh, the Chinese one that's currently uh, on the far side of the moon. Uh, Chang'e is on the far side. Um, the uh, Chandrayaan lander will be on the near side, uh, but actually closer to the South Pole. It's uh, it's going to be a, a, at about 70 degrees of south latitude, uh, so very much in the in the moon's Arctic, uh, Antarctic. I beg your pardon, because it's the south. Um, it's a very highland area. You know, there are mountains and craters absolutely uh, covering this area. So it's going to be a challenge to get the thing down on a, on a site that's flat enough for it to stand upright and for the lander to work. But, um, the you know, the, the chances seem to be uh, good that that will happen. But uh, more especially... Um, the, the, the reason why they're choosing this landing site uh, on the near side is that perhaps the most interesting feature on the far side is something called the, the Aitken South Pole Basin, which is the biggest dent in the solar system pretty well. comes about because of a, an asteroid impact very early in the moon's history. Mm. And that threw, threw material out from the uh, from basically from the moon's mantle, the, the layer underneath the crust. And it's thought that where, um, where the lander, the Indian lander will take touch down is about where some of the most interesting minerals will have landed after that uh, after that impact so, so there might be stuff on the surface that really is is uh, samples of the moon's mantle R really interesting uh, you know philosophy of, of the science to, 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 to be extracted from this and I, I wish them well I um, yes. hopefully all will go well and we'll have some great results from the lunar surface and um, yeah hence the reason for a rover so you can get out and do that exploring and pick up yeah. your samples and do your analysis and um, you know, if you're relying on landing on one spot and just scraping something up, which is how they did it early on the Mars missions, um, you, you could miss a heck of a lot. But uh, we've got better exactly. technology right. these days, so hopefully that will um, that will prevail, and, and we'll get some um, some new information about the moon. How many countries have now landed on the moon? We've got the United States, we've got Russia, we've got China, we've got Israel, we've got India potentially. Yeah, Israel. Of course, the the landing was uh, well, it wasn't up. really a landing, but yeah, that's you know, right. So you know, okay, how many countries have left debris <laughs> on the moon? <laughs> so three basically so far, and three. hopefully four four by Saturday. Okay. Yes, that's right. We will watch with interest, and uh, yeah, good luck to them. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a huge success. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Roger, your lot's are here also. Space nuts. Now, Fred, to the topic of your discussion last night in Adelaide, in fact, uh, eight new fast radio bursts have been detected. Uh, these things are popping up from time to time, and as uh, most things do in astronomy, they create more questions than answers. <laughs> what do we know about these ones? Mm, um, not much, really. 
<laughs> so must have um, been a short talk. Yeah, it was a short talk. Yeah, no, I, I, I did a lot of scene setting last night, and um, you know, a lot of um, analysis of uh, current Australian astronomy and how it how it uh, benefits our studies of things like fast radio bursts. Uh, okay, quick potted history of fast radio bursts. First one discovered, I think it was two thousand and six, although it was reported in two thousand and seven uh, by Duncan Lorimer of uh, West Virginia University, if I remember rightly. Uh, and his team, um, they found uh, this single blip in archival data from the Parkes Radio Telescope. They're actually looking for, for pulsars, these pulsating, rotating neutron stars. But they found just this blip of radio radiation, which was quite uh, strong. And um, by analysing the details of it, um, something called the dispersion of the radio waves allowed them to realise that this was an object deep in space, probably, uh, you know, a billion light years away or something like that. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, a succession of these things discovered by the Arecibo radio dish uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, so um, the, 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 the objects are characterised by the fact that uh, over a period of just a handful of milliseconds, there's this bright radio flash, which, given the distance of these things, which are kind of known to be what we call cosmological, which means a long way away, um, that, that, uh, that, that they are very, very energetic. You know, that they push out data, sorry, push out energy, which <clears throat> is kind of the same as the sun emits in a year or something like uh, something like that. Sorry, 10 ta 10,000 times what the sun emits in a year. Wow. Let, let me get the, the facts right. It's a huge amount of energy um, and very brief. And we still don't know what they are. But uh, it was actually a, um, data from Arecibo, which I think in 2015 um, led to the, the, the discovery of the first repeating one of these, a, a radio burst, fast radio burst that actually repeats, not in a periodic way, it's quite a sporadic repetition. But the fact that it repeats means that you could, um, you know, look at the spot in the sky where it comes from and, and see, you, you could basically determine where this object is in the sky fairly accurately because it, it does it more than once. And then... Uh, look at it with different sorts of telescopes, optical telescopes, that's visible light ones, uh, infrared telescopes and things like that, and look at what's there. And it, it turns out that the repeater is in the sort of outskirts of a very ordinary dwarf galaxy at a distance of about 3 billion light years. Uh, nothing really to tell you what is special about the environment in which this object exists. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of repeaters, that was the situation at the beginning of this year. Uh, there was only one repeater. It rejoiced in the name of FRB 121102 to give it its proper title. <clears throat> uh, then in, in January, a second repeater was found, um, and that got people very excited. Uh, Meanwhile, many of the single shot ones had been observed, and, and I think the total now is well over 100 of these single shot uh, fast radio bursts. Uh, but as I said, in January this year, the, the, the sum total of repeaters was two. But then within the last couple of weeks, we've had a report from a telescope. <coughs> Excuse me, Andrew. <coughs> with a, a telescope with the wonderful name of CHIME. CHIME is the Canadian Hydrogen Intens uh, Intensity Mapping Experiment. And it's a radio dish in British Columbia, or actually a succession of not so much dishes as troughs. They're telescopes that are fixed in space, low-frequency telescopes. Um, and they have turned up eight repeaters. Wow. Uh, so that's, you know, that's put a new a whole new dimension on, on this study of fast radio bursts. It looks as though something like 10% of all known fast radio bursts are actually objects that repeat. That creates a mystery in itself. I mean, uh, trying to understand a single shot fast radio burst would probably be more logical because it was a single event. But to yeah. get repeaters, and, and yeah. this one being, what, an eight? Eight repeats? Is that what we're talking about? No, no. I'm saying that there are eight radio oh, eight. sources in the sky which are known to repeat. Right. So, um, that, so that sort of makes the whole thing somewhat more complex. It does because you, you can sort of, you know, you can imagine that, okay, if you've got one of these things, if you've got these things that just pop off, uh, 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 so single shot versions of the fast radio bursts, 
then you could account for that by some sort of cataclysmic event like the end of a star or something like that. Mm. But when they do it again and again and again, then that explanation doesn't hold up. And so, I mean, I am, you know, the, the theory, theoretical work that's going definitely going on in the background trying to understand these things is stuff that I'm not really very familiar with but um, my colleagues in the fast radio burst trade if I can put it that way talk about magnetar flares on magnetars magnetars are very highly magnetized neutron stars and apparently if they get flares on the surface they can be very energetic okay. uh, but I don't know you know I'm not in a position to be able to judge whether that's a reasonable explanation people have suggested colliding neutron stars as well which we would perhaps be able to detect by gravitational waves um, uh, because we've seen evidence from gravitational waves of colliding neutron stars. So um, uh, unfortunately, they don't sort of tally with fast radio bursts. Um, but the mystery, I think, is still wide open that we've got some of these things that repeat and some don't. The repeaters are in the minority, but they're not unique. That was the, you know, the big news this year. And that's certainly what uh, what differentiates our present knowledge from what we would, would have been talking about this time last year when there was only one repeater. Yeah. I suppose um, we're also probably trapping ourselves in thinking, well, you know, this this must be caused by similarities in events, but maybe not. Maybe there's all sorts of different ways fast radio bursts can be created that we, you know, we might need to think a bit more outside the box. Exactly. Well, there is one person, <clears throat> excuse me again, there's one person who's doing that, and that is Avi Loeb of the Harvard Centre for Astrophysics. Um, you and I have spoken about Avi before because he was very quick a couple of years ago to suggest that one possibility for such flashes in space might be um, people using uh, radio lasers or something like that to propel light sails uh, through the universe. Uh, it's, you know, it's uh, basically... An off the wall suggestion. What, people uh, other than us. People other than us. That's oh, right. Oh, okay. That's you, interesting. People, yes, people of species and planets different from our own, right. uh, whizzing light sails through the universe. Um, I think that's a suggestion that most astronomers, uh, you know, they're, they're slightly sceptical of. But nevertheless, it's a valid point because he says that the physical parameters are consistent with with what you get. But um, anyway, that's uh, that remains to be seen. I have to say that um, uh, you know, he, Avi Loeb is very keen on the idea of radio, of, of sorry, of uh, solar sailing or light sail mm. technology because he's part of the breakthrough Starshot venture, which is looking at the possibility of sending a light sail uh, to Proxima Centauri. Uh, and he was also, I think, uh, very quick to point out that when U Umuamua uh, flew through the, the inner space solar system, doogie. Yeah, that it was, that's right, the very same, that that might be an alien spacecraft uh, with a solar sail rather than uh, rather than just an asteroid. So you, you get a theme here and, um, uh, well, it's very provocative. That's the best way you can put it. Yeah, oh, well, it, it certainly gets the uh, attention of the media and that's what it's all about yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, I, that's why I keep calling it the space doogie. I want all and sundry to pick that up. Oh, they'll throw you out eventually. <laughs> not, it's not doing <laughs> Not doing the rounds, unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, more to learn, a lot more to learn about fast radio burst re re uh, repeaters. Uh, we um, will hopefully solve that one in the not-too-distant future. Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here and Professor Fred Watson there. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, another shout-out to uh, our supporters on Patreon. Uh, the numbers keep climbing, and we're very appreciative uh, that people are willing to sign up and just um, put a little bit of um, money in the kitty to support uh, Space Nuts. It's a wonderful thing to do, and um, we really appreciate it. And if you would like to do the same, you can do that at patreon.com slash space nuts. Uh, there are different options there, and uh, we're building up some benefits for our patrons which will um, sort of uh, 
develop over time. I'm leaving that up to the production crew, but uh, patreon.com slash space nuts if you're interested in uh, signing up to support us with uh, just a, a couple of dollars a month. And, uh, of course, the Space Nuts podcast group, Fred, is uh, growing at a rate of knots. They, um, they, they're, getting, they're, they're numbering well over 100 now, and uh, they're, they're sort of uh, talking to each other, showing each other photographs of their telescopes uh, and all sorts of things. It's really fantastic. So I'm, I'm so pleased that, um, that our podcast is bringing people together from all over the world. So if you would like to join the Space Nuts podcast group, it's on Facebook, and uh, you just need to uh, ask to join and we'll sort it all out for you. Now, Fred, we, uh, I'm going to tackle a few questions. This one from Matt Geezer in Exeter in England, uh, who says he's a very keen listener of the podcast. Hi, Matt. My question concerns the missing mass in the cosmos. Is it possible that neutrinos have a higher mass than currently predicted? If their mass was two or three times or more than currently predicted, it could account for much but I doubt all, of the missing mass in the cosmos. Is it possible our current measurement of neutrino mass is incorrect to such a degree? Good question, Matt. Fred, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I do recall um, some work, it's a few years ago now, when I you know, hung out with cosmologists, uh, because they, basically it's, it's looking at the wider universe that, that actually gives... Uh, a, a, an estimate of the mass of the neutrino and I do recall a time when the uh, idea of a massive neutrino was essentially uh, written out of the equation by looking at things like the cosmic background radiation this is what you know the flash of the big bang the way the uh, the way that the temperature variations in that are observed uh, and also um, just the, the large scale structure in the universe today. So it was the, something called the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, which was published in the early 2000s. This is, uh, it was at the time, the, the biggest survey of galaxies out to a distance of about two and a half billion uh, light years. And, and it gives you this framework because you, what you see is uh, the fact that the universe is a kind of honeycomb uh, of galaxies uh, arranged along the, the, the edges of the honeycomb. And, it, and it's that that, um, it, you know, it sounds unlikely, but from that work, you, you actually can deduce the mass of the neutrino. And I think it comes, I think it comes about because of, um, it's something to do with the, you know, ratios between the number of neutrinos and the number of photons uh, that uh, are present, certainly in the cosmic microwave background, that's the case, uh, in, in, the, in the structure um, Models that uh, pe you know that basically we we get from the redshift surveys, uh, then you, you you can interpret that in a similar way, and and the bottom line is that um, the neutrinos uh, do not have enough mass uh, to contribute to the dark matter. They're they're a good candidate because um, they are they almost they interact hardly at all with normal matter mm. uh, but we can detect them there are detectors such as ice cube at the south pole that can find that can pick up cosmic neutrinos um uh, so it, it it's the, the likelihood is that our estimate uh, at least our estimate of the upper limit of the mass of a neutrino is very constrained uh, and it does not actually uh, it, it's nowhere near enough to, to count for the, the missing matter in the universe uh, yeah. a, 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 a waffly answer to a very good question bottom line uh, it's is it's, uh, it's certainly not a miscalculation and um, Matt's theory uh, well thought out um, will, yeah cannot be the answer to the unknown mass of the universe. That is the bottom line. That is the bottom line. All right. Yes. Thank you, Matt, for your question. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to a question from Gary Wilson, who uh, is in Springwood up in um, the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. Beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, he said, hi, Fred and Andrew. Asteroid 2000 QW7 is path passing Earth on September the 16th. Will we be able to see it with the naked eye from Sydney? And what time would it be passing closest to Earth? I guess we'll know if it hits us. This is yet another asteroid that um, all the uh, uh, reputable media outlets around the world have um, basically gone doomsday angle. <laughs> uh, it's not going to hit us. 
It won't hit us, no, that's right. And I don't think this one will ever hit us because it's um, it's in an orbit that's locked in such a way that it whizzes past the Earth but doesn't actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's never a, a time when it's in the same place at the same time as the Earth, at least not for the foreseeable future, which in this sort of um, science goes several hundred years in, down the track. Mm. Um, uh, its nearest approach is, uh, I think, five million kilometres. Um, and it's it's about uh, it's something like up to six hundred meters long. It's um, a big one, isn't it? Its size, it's quite big, but at five million kilometers, it's not going to be visible with the naked eye. Um, it, it's uh, it, I, I've been I've just been trying to find the details, and they are pretty. Um, Pretty freely available on the web. I've got a I've got an absolute magnitude for it, which is not very helpful. That's the the, the basically the, the parameter which you use to, to measure the brightness of things. Um, I, I don't even know whether it'd be visible in small telescopes. It's it, it's a long way away. Uh, its approach to the Earth is um, you know it's in the news and everything because it's such a big one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it is in terms of visibility, I, I haven't really been able to get my... Um... Well, let's say for the sake of sensationalism, <laughs> uh, if, uh, if a rock that big hit Earth, yeah. what would be the effect? 600 oh. metres. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, significant. It, it's, um, so uh, you're talking about uh, nationwide damage uh, and devastation for something that size uh, because of the energy that it, it, it imparts. Um, you know, uh, travelling, I think its approach, uh, its approach is, um, so, okay, we've got 1,600... Uh, kilometers per hour at that sort of speed uh, you're, you're you're basically an impact vaporizes the rock and causes you know shock waves and all the rest of it so interesting stuff and yeah. thank you for sensationalization That's good. Uh, yes indeed um, <laughs> okay so uh, probably not visible uh, with the naked eye or even a small telescope so uh, chances are um, yeah, you're going to need some good gear to be able to spot this one, uh, I'm afraid. But, um, yeah, look, uh, that doesn't mean don't try because um, you, you might be lucky. You you never know. I wouldn't even know where to look, Fred, to be honest. I'd, I'd have no, to do some gotta, research. Uh, things like this move so quickly through the, the sky because they're relatively near. You need, um, you know, very up-to-date what are called finding charts. You, you've got to you, – you've basically got to lock onto it um, – and it's it's a it's a formidable thing to do. So I don't think many of us will see it. Okay. Um, and thank you, Gary, for the question. So let's move on to our final question for this week's episode from Duncan Sargent. Duncan's written to us a few times, I think. Uh, he's written another question more recently than this one, but we're trying to do some catching up. Uh, and um, thank you for the question, Duncan. Uh, if we manage to get a base on the moon or an asteroid or both and start using whatever is there to make propellant to refuel our spacecraft... Um, does that mean we can do away with those tricky heat shields as we will have enough fuel on board of a powered um, descent back to Earth um, as we can fuel in space? And as such, will we be able to slow our spaceships right down and slowly lower them back to the ground rather than deorbiting in the way that we have to now? If not, why not? Good question. <laughs> it's a great question. Mm. Um, so uh, you, that's you know that's a really good point, and it kind of harps back to what we we're just talking about with the Chandrayaan uh, spacecraft, because that's exactly what it's going to do. It's going to use fuel uh, and retro thrusters to to bring it down. Um, the The problem is still uh, that you need a lot of energy to to do this slowdown, but. Um, OK, we've got a classic example of how this can work already because, of course, Elon Musk is bringing uh, his boosters down from orbital velocity uh, to, uh, to zero velocity using small amounts of fuel left in the spacecraft. Mm. So it, it suggests that the answer to Duncan's question is yes, uh, that, that if we've got unlimited fuel, 
maybe we can dispense with the tricky heat shields. Uh, the, it's because the, the, the Elon Musk boosters have, have already taken uh, the spacecraft almost up to orbital velocity. Uh, and there is, there's a, a small amount of aero braking involved, but I think that's more about stabilizing the, the movement of the spacecraft. The real braking is done by, by the retro rockets. So uh, I think... Uh, you know, Duncan's suggestion is a good one. And maybe in the future, we will see power descent back to uh, the surface of Earth, uh, which, uh, you know, it, a, a lot is going to wind up depending on the economics. If it's more economical to have a heat shield and slow it down with aero braking, well, that's what will happen. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that the technology exists to do it now uh, with with retro retro rockets, uh, and as Duncan says, to do away with the tricky heat shields. Well, it might be safer too, I imagine. Uh, we've had you know, some tragedies with heat shields in the past and um, it would appear to me to be able to control descent rather than rely on just sort of whipping through the atmosphere at high speed with high levels of heat would be more desirable. Yeah, although, yes, there were tragedies, but... Um the, the so if you think of the shuttle and you know there was what was it 130 shuttle missions each of which apart from the two that failed uh, each of which used the heat shield to slow the spacecraft down and return to earth mm. uh, it was very tricky um the two tragedies were not directly a result of the heat shield they were the, the you know they were caused other, by other issues damage yeah. that's right so um it's it, in many ways it's a fairly routine procedure but uh yeah to to my mind i kind of agree with duncan it's a lot neater and tidier to fire your retro rocket and bring oh, it yeah. down that way. <laughs> i would yeah um, you know bring on you know Warp factor one and and pulse. What do they call it? I can't remember now. Star yeah, Trek. All of that stuff. Terminology. The only thing is, you know, you wouldn't mind. So, so if you if you press the button to fire your retro rocket and nothing happened, you'd think, oh, I wish I had a heat shield. Yes, that's that's <laughs> a good point. Uh, yeah, that, that 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 could be a pitfall, I imagine, yeah. uh, and a definite fall. Not a very elegant one either. Mm. No. All right. Um, Duncan, thanks for the question. The answer is yes, by the sound of it. Um, that's where we're going to have to leave it this week. Thanks to everybody who's contributed and um, um, listened in and, uh, and, and constantly uh, pe peppering us with questions and, and talking to each other on, on our Facebook podcast group. It's fantastic. We've got quite a little astronomical community going now, Fred, which uh, is, is a joy. Uh, and thank you as always. Um, travel safe home from Adelaide and we will talk to you again next week. It sounds very good. Thank you very much, Andrew, and I look forward to the next time. A great pleasure. Uh, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, joins us every week on Space Nuts, as do I and as do you, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again next week on another edition of the podcast we like to call Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.